Fantastic. Uh, I'd now like to present um, our next keynote speaker, who is Vanessa Andriotti. And Vanessa's topic is inequalities and global challenge. Please make Vanessa welcome. Thank you. Um, I would like to start by acknowledging the Aboriginal people uh, who are the uh, ancestral custodians and traditional owners of the land. And I would like to thank Judy Crow and Marion Haley for the incredible hospitality of your invitation, the invitation to be here. So uh, just a little bit about me um, so that you understand the context of the presentation. And it's become a little bit of a joke in the, in the family, also the story I'm going to tell. Um, I'm based at the University of British Columbia in Canada, uh, in Vancouver. Before that, I was in Finland coordinating a teacher education program at the University of Oulu. Before that, I was in New Zealand uh, for four years, uh, working at the University of Canterbury, but also with the government in the implementation of the new curriculum, new then, uh, now it's probably old already. Before that, I was in England and in Ireland, uh, working with NGOs in the area of global citizenship education, but I was born and raised in Brazil in a mixed heritage family of German and indigenous ancestry. Um, I, tr I have two kids uh, and they travel on a Portuguese passport and don't ask me how that happened. But this is um, the nature of our family. It's a very, very um, mixed uh, culturally and otherwise ideological you two family. And this is one of the reasons why my area of research is globalization, education, especially global citizenship education. I'm a Canada Research Chair in the area of inequalities and global change, and that's why I think I was introduced with that title. But today, I'm going to be concentrating on the challenges for education about global citizenship. So the presentation is organized in four different uh, sections, where I'm going to be uh, introducing uh, the topic, talking about global forces, unprecedented challenges, and usual responses. Um, I'm going to lo look at two uh, international policies that have come up in the last couple of years, uh, especially the UNESCO document on global citizenship education and one policy from Canada as well that I think would be a model for other countries. And then um, I'm going to be focusing more on the presentation on enduring problematic imaginaries and practices that we find in this area of global citizenship education. And this is the uh, focus of my research. Uh, but also, uh, at the end of the presentation, I'm going to talk about alternative views and horizons for global citizenship education. I'm going to give an outline, uh, but actually, this is the topic that we're going to be exploring further in the workshops. So, in order to start, uh, this, this is actually a definition of globalization that comes from Sharon Todd. And she talks about globalization as the intensification of migration, interconnectivity, cultural hybridity, ecological vulnerability, wealth concentration, armed conflict, reconfiguration of economic and political power, and global capitalism. We're not going to talk about global capitalism today. I looked at uh, all these uh, different aspects of globalization and tried to think about uh, throughout the years now the specific challenges that they bring to education, and this is just an outline of the challenges that I find uh, affect teachers the most. So, for example, in terms of migration, we have uh, polarization and racism, and you can see that especially now in Europe with the refugee crisis and how different others are perceived uh, in terms of mobility, uh, how that causes uh, anxieties uh, in local populations. In terms of interconnectivity, I put here challenges to the authority or the monopoly of knowledge production of universities and schools in, in our ability to decide what knowledge is worth knowing because if students Google a topic, of course they know there are very uh, uh, a vast array of answers to any problems, but these answers on the internet are leveled, so we don't know uh, the amount of rigor that goes in any of uh, these explorations of responses or in each response itself. So this is, this is another challenge that we might uh, decide to explore further. I'm also working with, um, in my work with a book called um, Alone Together by Cher Sherry um, Turkle. And she uh, has a very interesting thesis that associates the rising levels of anxiety, depression, and self-harm also to problems of uh, relationships related to interconnectivity. It's a very good book. Um, in terms of cultural hybridity, 
conflictual identities, so the boxes that we used to have for different cultures and identities are not working in the same way anymore. People are negotiating things in much more complex and fluid ways, and this affects the way that we deal with internationalization and diversity in the classroom. Um, in terms of eco ecological vulnerability, there is a complexity of the issue, uh, a lot of misinformation, and how we uh, deal with information in the classroom is also an issue. In terms of wealth concentration, of course, there is uncertainty about the future. Uh, this causes a lot of distress for the students in terms of their perspectives, in terms of armed conflict, the normalization of violence, and in terms of reconfiguration of economic and political power, we have political mistrust and externalize our projected responsibility, responsibility and blame. And this is across the board in all countries that I've been to when we talk about austerity. Uh, generally, there's some scapegoating and we are still finding um, still learning about how to deal with that in education. <laughs> so, usual responses to this um, uh, in policy and in the discourse, and this is my own uh, take on the response, is to equip learners to address the increasing complexity, uncertainty, diversity, and unfortunately growing levels of inequality and conflict in contemporary societies. And generally, when you, when you look at different countries, uh, the responses, uh, some of the, the, the three use, usual responses are more technology, uh, individualized learning, and internationalization and global education. I think as a researcher, uh, I look critically at the three of them, but my work actually focuses on the third one, on internationalization and global citizenship. And that's why I've chosen a uh, UNESCO document as an example here for us to talk about in terms of the changes that are happening in this area. So UNESCO uh, has launched this document in 2014, and I've been looking at policies uh, from 1994 to, to today, and this is one of the best documents that I've seen in the area, because it frames uh, global education as a paradigm um, that encapsulates how education can develop the knowledge, skills, values, and attitudes learners need for securing a world which is more just, peaceful, tolerant, inclusive, secure, and sustainable. So, um, conceptualizing global citizenship education as a paradigm is actually something new. Um, and it talks about a conceptual shift that recognizes the relevance of education in understanding and resolving global issues in their local, political, cultural, economic, and environmental dimensions. Also, this multi-dimensional approach to global citizenship, uh, although not new, I think it's more nuanced uh, in this document. The document also talks about fostering in learners both cognitive skills and non-cognitive skills. And here I picked two that I find really important. So uh, the first one talks about a multi-perspective approach uh, that recognizes the different dimensions, perspectives, and angles of issues. And in terms of non-cognitive skills, talking about the ability to network and interact with people of different backgrounds, origins, cultures, and perspectives. So not understanding dissent as something that is threatening, uh, not on, only working on the basis of consensus, but of consentment uh, to different worldviews, different uh, ideas, different ways of knowing. And I think this is uh, really good in terms of a policy, but it's extremely difficult to do in practice uh, in terms of promoting learning in this area. And today we're going to explore a little bit why. So, although I'm saying that this document is really uh, fantastic in comparison to the other documents, it still has a few limitations that I'm going to return to uh, towards the end of the presentation. So bear with me for that. The next document that I would like to point you to is the National Youth White Paper on Global Citizenship. This is also a document um, that was uh, created in 2014. It was actually released in 2015. And it was a consultation paper with young people that happened in Canada across all different process, uh, provinces involving about 800 people, young people. Uh, so in this document, the, the intention of the people who created the framework for this was that this was a document created by young people that would influence policy uh, in Ottawa and it is being used to influence policy at a federal level. And in this document, young people say that to achieve global equity, as global citizens, we must value the perspectives of all citizens, challenge preconceived ideas, encourage explorations into various perspectives and collaboration with global communities, and think critically, and be taught to think critically. Now, critical thinking here can be understood in a multitude of ways. 
it can be understood as problem solving, it can be understood as anti-bias education, it can be understood as uh, understanding power relations, etc. So this is also a discussion that I think uh, needs more shared vocabulary for us to understand from a multiple perspective what critical thinking uh, entails. And this is, this is an interesting feature of this document. So again, like the UNESCO document, this document is, goes a long way in pushing conversations, but as I will try to demonstrate at the end of the presentation, it still um, goes back to certain limitations in terms of what it uh, imagines is possible in education. So having said that, I'm now going to concentrate on the enduring difficult challenges that I found in my research uh, in relation to global citizenship education. And my research has, um, has been done in multiple countries, and um, it's not only me doing it, my field of research is a growing field looking at representations of inequalities, uh, representations of poverty and of different cultures in the media, uh, in the work of NGOs, and in the curriculum of schools. Now, in order to invite you to come with me on this, uh, uh, on this journey of enduring challenges, uh, I would like to invite you to imagine a field of corn. And um, just close your eyes, imagine the corn, harvest your corn very quickly with all the corn in front of you. And let me know if the corn that you have imagined looks like this. Anybody had the corn more or less like this? Well, it's, it's normal for us to imagine the yellow corn cob as the corn that, uh, that, that comes to the imagination. This is because we have only been exposed to the yellow corn cob. So I use the yellow corn in the multicolored corn cobs to talk about this dominant perspective um, it, that is normalized, that uh, is normalized and naturalized as a single story of progress, development, and human evolution. So the yellow corn cob is the blueprint that establishes what we can imagine uh, in terms of schooling, for example, education, relationships, security, nationhood, justice, law, um, I said relationships, faith, uh, the way that people should dress, etc. And when we think about uh, the um, the yellow corn cob in relation to the multicolored corn cob. If we're coming from the perspective that the only the yellow corn cob is, is the legitimate corn cob, when we have these relationships, uh, yellow corn cobs might try to paint the other corn cobs, the corn cob yellow, um, corn cobs yellow, or multicolored corn cobs might also want to become yellow because that is the uh, color of most prestige. Other people in education and in other areas, for example, in sociology, have talked about this problem. And one of them is uh, Professor Boaventura de Souza Santos, who introduced another metaphor, which is the metaphor of the abyss, to talk about this thinking. So he says that our perspective uh, within modernity is that uh, our way of thinking is unlimited. Our way of knowing is unlimited. And this unlimited way of knowing is not aware of its own limitations. So if we're speaking from a yellow corn cob perspective in this idea that our way of knowing is unlimited, we create something that this, this sociology calls abyssal thinking. That it's like we, have, we are on top of the, this abyss and anything beyond the abyss is unintelligible. So it doesn't exist. So other corn cobs are rendered uh, worthless, right? So other, other uh, ideologies, perspectives, cultures, are perceived as worthless. And he sees that as a loss. And he talks about the need to reach the edges of our imaginaries, to sit at that edge in the difficulties of that. Because it's not simply going to the edge and thinking that what is unintelligible will immediately become intelligible. So for example, thinking about Aboriginal communities, going to an Aboriginal uh, uh, community and thinking that you can capture uh, the knowledge and bring it back to the curriculum. It's not as simple as that. Uh, because we are always projecting our own frames of reference into uh, what we see. So being cognizant of our frames of reference is something that um, is part of this idea of reaching the, edge of, the edges of knowing, but also understanding that at that edge, uh, we will feel uncomfortable because our securities, our securities of ways of being and knowing will be challenged if we want to be invited into something new. So back to the yellow corn cob, I'm just going to give you one big example that I always show 
uh, in terms of um, how these perceptions are shaped in society. And this is a survey called the Modi Survey, Modi School, uh, School Omnibus Survey conducted by the Department for International Development in 2007. This survey was um, run in schools, carried out in schools from uh, 1993 to 2007. And what I'm going to show you here is one example of a question that was asked in the survey that was really poorly written, but that in the way it was written, it illustrates the problems that I'm talking about. So I want you to imagine that you are the schools, uh, you are part of the schools that are answering the survey. So these are our students, middle years and uh, senior years uh, answering the survey. And the question that they had to answer is, how can poorer countries affect us in the UK? And they had six different answers to choose from. The first answer was by getting us involved in the conflicts. Number two, by increasing risks of diseases spreading in the UK. Number three, by increasing the number of people wanting to live here. Number four, by affecting our jobs and our economy. Number five, by damaging the Earth's environment. And number six, my, my favorite, <laughs> by making our foreign holidays more than So this is the kind of problems that I'm having to, uh, to, to address in education. And you can see that in each of these items, there is a construction of the self in relation to an other. So if the, self, if the other uh, is violent, the self is peaceful. If the other is, um, in fact, uh, has diseases, the self is healthy. If the other uh, lives in a country in disarray, our country is perfect. Uh, if the other doesn't have a job, our, in, our economy is good and they are threatening our economy. If uh, the other damages the Earth's environment, we don't, right? Forget about the, the amount of waste, waste we consume as uh, we are able to. And we are entitled to safe holidays in that country. So this creates a situation where the yellow horn hub is perceived or associated with concepts like intelligence, benevolence, deservedness or entitlements, cleanness, capacity, and leadership, whereas the, color card, uh, the multicolored card crops uh, uh, associated with lack, inadequacy, ignorance, violence, helplessness, servitude, and waste. Now, this is extremely difficult uh, to, um, to challenge. Uh, and one of the reasons is that uh, this single story of progress, development, human evolution that puts the yellow corn crop at the top uh, is something that is at the DNA of our society. So that's how we justify a lot of things. That's what we get from the media. That's how uh, we justify our privilege. So um, negotiating this is not just a question of thinking differently or even behaving differently. It is a question that goes back to deeper assumptions about how our society is organized and what we value. So uh, in terms of addressing this in education, uh, I've been looking at the relationships uh, and the partnerships created uh, when we have this, this encounter between yellow and uh, multicolored corn cobs. And one of the things I've created is this acronym Heads Up, which is an, a kind of an evaluation checklist looking at partnerships, engagements, and representations. And what I found over and over again in textbooks and in the media and the work of NGOs is that uh, these relationships tend to be hegemonic. Uh, they reinforce or justify the status quo. Ethnocentric, they project one view as universal. Ahistorical, they forget historical legacies and complex complicities. Depoliticize, they disregard power inequalities and ideologies. They tend to be salvationist and or self-serving or self-congratulatory invested in self-congratulatory heroism. We're going there to make a difference, to help them, but without thinking about how we are related in other ways and, or how that helps us. Uncomplicated, offering few good quick fixes, and paternalistic, waiting for a thank you at the end of the, uh, of the interaction. So many different people have used this uh, to try to identify and challenge uh, problematic practices uh, in research and in schools, but it's important to say that this, again, is, is difficult learning. Uh, and if we challenge all of the things all at the same time, we would probably become unintelligible because this is part of the ways that we think 
about these things. So it's ongoing work, it's not a place of arrival that we get for, um, for challenging these patterns. It's lifelong and life-wide. It comes back in without us knowing. So these are the enduring, uh, in terms of enduring difficult challenges, these are the three questions that I have, I have focused my work in. So the question number one, how can we see the systemically and historically marginalized other as equally intelligent, equally capable, equally knowledgeable, equally deserving, equally contradictory and complex beyond essentialist representations? How do we recognize both similarities and differences in assumptions and aspirations beyond our desire for enforcing consensus? And how can we see the limits of the knowledge we consider universal and unlimited so that we can open up to different possibilities of coexistence? So in that sense, one of the things that I have um, done in my work uh, was to look at how we can uh, operate in this interface. How can we sit at the edge of our knowing and be invited into different possibilities? In one project, which is a Creative Commons project, was also funded by the British government uh, and is available for free online, is called <coughs> Through Other Eyes. So it was published in 2008. It was based on interviews with Maori, Chewa, Quechua, Guarani, and Australian Aboriginal educators. And the idea here was not, it was not a project about Aboriginal communities or indigenous communities. It was a project that uh, by looking at some of these perspectives, we could challenge our own or we could sit at that edge. It was actually a problem uh, project about Western frames of thinking and the complexities of both. So it's not trying to say it's one against the other or uh, either one or the other, but that interface, that edge, uh, is something that uh, is complex and needs to be, um, it needs specific learning um, to be designed for that. So we looked at different views on equality, poverty, development, and education, and uh, we tried to promote critical examinations of interpretations of both Westerns and indigenous worldviews. So this project is still used by teachers um, NGOs and both in higher education and in high schools and teacher education to try to open up uh, this realm of learning. Now, the, the um, offshoot of this project is a project now that has been funded by the Canadian government, which is called Through the Eyes of Global Ancestors. And this is a, bit, a, little bit, uh, a project that is a little bit different. Uh, it focuses on planetary challenges and horizons for education based on relational ontologies. Our base literature is non-anthropocentric relational ontologies and interviews with elders on ceremonial grounds, uh, Aboriginal elders in Canada. And we're, what we're trying to do in this project, uh, in terms of mainstream education, is to say that this perspective, these Aboriginal perspectives are not a substitute uh, for the stories we tell in the mainstream, but they are evidence that it is possible to imagine existence otherwise. So I'm going to tell you one of the stories that we use in this project so that you can have an idea of what we are trying to do in terms of challenging um, the, the um, amplification of the perspective of the yellow corn cob. So this is uh, this, a story that is related to the picture there of the four, there are four mountains. So it's a, the story of the Four Mountains uh, is related to the goal of education. So this is a story of Elder John Cryer, who says that the goal of education, the goal, the, the, goal, the goal of education, is to support children into becoming good grandparents and great grandparents for all relations, human and more than human. So what he's saying in relation to the to the the story of the the three the four mountains is that. The first mountain is the mountain where we are not self-sufficient in our walking. We are never self-sufficient because we always need our communities. But when we can't walk on our own, we need, we, we need to, our hand to be held. So that's the baby mountain. The second mountain, he said, is where, um, I would say it's our adolescence, uh, where people have to go into a dark forest and uh, to learn about who they are. But it's not a who they are that is fixed, it's a who they are in terms of the skills that they have been gifted to be gifted back to the community. And he said that the forests know uh, who these kids are, uh, but they cannot tell them directly. They have to show them. So the kids then become very um, um, angry, I guess, and try to um, shoot the shadows of the, of, the, of the trees. So it's, it's a period of a lot of struggle 
of uh, trying to figure out who you are, uh, trying to understand the language of the forest, trying to tell you. So this is uh, called the warrior mountain, where you're trying to um, battle the world in order to figure out what your skills are. The next mountain is the hunter mountain, where you, are, you already know what your gifts are and you are offering these gifts to be able to feed your community. And the last mountain is the elder mountain. And he said that uh, our bodies do not finish the mountain. We have to shed the body um, as, as we walk um, up that mountain. One of the things that he said, which is interesting, is that the elder mountain touches the baby mountain because <laughs> The, and that's why the children have to be with the elders, because the warriors have no patience and the hunters have no time for the young ones. And the elders are at the best position to be able to um, impact patience, wisdom, it, wisdom, because in that mountain, what you lose is your arrogance. And the other function of the elder here is also in the transition from one mountain to another, so in rites of passage that can um, help people to to come down one mountain and start another one. We also asked the elders uh, throughout the project what the problems of education, of mainstream education were, and we were surprised with the answers. So in Canada, for example, they have, uh, this is the medicine wheel, it's there in the middle, uh, and they've explained it to us using that symbol, that we are four uh, dimensional beings with spiritual, cognitive, physical, and affective dimensions, and if we have an imbalance in these dimensions, we're going to get sick. So uh, what they say is that mainstream education, the imbalance is the uh, over-focus on uh, the cognitive side, the intellectual side. So if there is an imbalance that uh, diminishes, for example, the spiritual side, people are going to feel a void and they are going to be disappointed because nothing is going to fill that void in their lives. If there's a physical imbalance, uh, there's a low life force and there's propensity for addiction. If there's a, uh, an imbalance in the affective side, uh, there's disconnect and self-exile, including self-harm. And in the cognitive side, and amplification is uh, an imbalance, there are poor decisions and there's arrogance. And we asked what needed to be done to, uh, to address these challenges and the responses were also very interesting. So in the spiritual side, people, uh, they said people needed silence, and silence is something that uh, people don't have today, and people uh, find it hard to actually deal with today. In the physical realm, we needed resonance, and this is to do with sound and rhythm. Uh, in the affective side, presence, and it's interesting because the conversation uh, went about our ways of dealing with emotions in the affective side are a lot about narration, and that's where our ontology comes from, that we have to process things through uh, dialogue or narrating things, and from their perspective, we needed to shut up and start to be present to each other, learning to relate beyond the need for this relationship to be mediated by knowledge. We need to learn to relate beyond knowledge, identity, and understanding. And in terms of the cognitive realm, we need the better stories. We are stuck in one story, and we need to be able to pluralize uh, the scope of possibilities. So this is used with uh, educators in, in Canada just as a way to not to say this is what we should be doing, uh, if we're not going in that direction. We're just saying there are very different ways to think about things. And what these stories show us is that um, it's possible. <laughs> Uh, and we can get inspired by that, not uh, in, as a way of replacing our stories, but as a way of, of inviting us to think about things in different ways, to imagine things in different ways, and to sit at the edge of that abyss. So this is, this is where I try to um, put it all together. So on the one side, we have individual freedom, autonomy, expression, um, anthropocentric, Cartesian um, rationality, on the other side, we have radical interdependence, visceral relationality, reciprocity, land-centered, non-dialectical or teleological reason. And I, here in the middle, what I tried to do was to uh, list the kinds of things that I found in the documents of UNESCO and Canada, in terms of these documents coming from an Enlightenment ontology, and the words that they use to describe global citizenship education. So they talk about empowerment, leadership, consensus, progress, 
uh, focus on national identity, although they say that this needs to be expanded, dialogue, innovation, affluence, and competition, whereas relational ontologies would have um, a contrasting view. So instead of empowerment, disarmament, leadership contrasted to decentering ourselves, consensus, pluriversality is the idea of consentment to other po possibilities of perspectives coexisting, even if they are incommensurable or paradoxical. Instead of progress, remembering in two senses here, both in the sense of remembering uh, in terms of memory, but remembering also in the sense of uh, putting back together a body, a communal body that has been dismembered. Instead of national identity, planetarity, instead of dialogue presencing, which includes shutting up, instead of innovation, wisdom, instead of affluence, giveaway, instead of competition, complementarity. And here, again, I'm not saying one is better than the other, but I'm saying that if we need both, we can't be stuck with just one of them, and we haven't been doing enough for the second one. So when people ask me, Vanessa, don't you want your kids, well, who are now um, old, but do you want your kids to have, not to have access to the first one, to the, the white one? And I say, of course not. Uh, I want my kids to have access to that. Do I want my kids to have access only to that? Of course not. I want my kids to be able to operate in many different worlds, both, both this and more. So it's not about either or, it's about both and more. I'll finish this with um, some experiments that uh, uh, we've been doing both in Canada and in Finland. This is actually coming from Finland um, that illustrates a little bit of what I'm talking about. This is a project called Crossing Local Borders, and this is being used as an evaluation and education mechanism or instrument uh, in, that is related to mobility and community field experiences. So the Finnish government is using something very similar to evaluate uh, and prepare people to go abroad, so international mobility experiences. So we, we talk about borders um, as in a very general sense, so it could be borders, uh, emotional borders, geographical borders, intellectual borders, borders of all kinds, and we talk about four dispositions. So the first disposition is the, the bottom one, the disposition of the fenced house, where you don't want to cross any borders because you perceive uh, an incommensurable threat uh, outside of the border. So you, you might want people to come in if they're safe, but you don't want to cross. So that's one disposition. The second disposition is when you want to cross the border in a caravan. Uh, here in Australia, it's camper van, right? So you, you go glamping. So you cross the border and you, are, you bring your home with you and you look at the world through that window. And the window is a tinted window. It re reflects you rather than where uh, you are, but you think that you're, you, you already know you're crossing and it's fine. The next disposition is the disposition of the tent, uh, where you feel that you are outside of your camper van, you are on the ground, and you put the tent there, but you only invite inside the tent uh, what feels comfortable, what makes you feel good. So mosquitoes and um, dirty shoes stay out. So again, you are invite, if you feel that you're very open, but actually what comes in is only what fits your framework, which are a bit flexible, they're not completely, like in a tent, it's not completely um, hard, but uh, there's something outside that you're not prepared um, to contemplate. The position, the disposition of the uh, straw hat is one where you're open to the weather. Uh, to the rain and the sun, and to the fact that the straw hat is going to get old if it gets wet, and you're going to have to reweave it, to weave it again. So the straw hat disposition is about facing a world that is plural, that is indeterminable, uh, that is complex, that is, uh, that is agonistic, that is paradoxical, that is contradictory, but that needs to affect you, and that you are affected by it, uh, by engaging with it. So. In terms of the four dispositions, we talk about them as having um, uh, affective, uh, cognitive, um, and performative uh, dimensions. And the idea here is that we bring all these dispositions with us all the time. Um, there's no question about that. It's not a developmental model where it's a stage where when you're, when, at one point you're here and then there and then there. No, we bring them all with us. And then when something happens in the context, one of them kicks in. Right, so you might be traveling and then and you think you're very open and then something happens, you go straight back to your house or straight back to your camper van. Um, 
So what we're trying to do with teachers and when we're using this, this uh, tool with other people is to see if by developing a vocabulary about the dispositions and the ability for us to observe our responses, if we can catch ourselves in one of the dispositions and then open up more possibilities for relating otherwise. So that's one of the things we use it for. The other thing we use it for is to talk about the fact that in education, we have been, in terms of intercultural communication and global citizenship education, we have been, do, been focusing on the camper van and on the tent. Very little is done for the hat, because the hat disposition requires a very different relationship to knowledge. And it, it's the hat disposition that requires the sitting at the edge of the abyss uh, and the being prepared for the difficulty that that, that entails, the discomfort that that entails, um, and also to to being affected by the unexpected. And that is something that our schooling system was not created for. So we need to shift this towards that, um, that understanding, not in order to eliminate the others, but in order to open up more possibilities. So we're using that um, experiment for that as well. So uh, in terms of international, international, international education, a lot of the things that uh, I also work with is this partnerships with communities in the South that are uh, in low-income countries. And one of the things that happens uh, a lot, or maybe marginalized communities here with Aboriginal communities, for example, is that when we are in the camper van, the desire is to help. When we are in the tent, the desire is to include. In the, the hat, the desire is to be center, to learn and to teach, but to be in a position of humility uh, when uh, engaging ethically with those communities. So having said that, um, here is a, a summary of the educational horizons that I see in this area. So the priority is to problematize the single story of progress, development, and human evolution, taking people to the edge. Uh, the question is how to support students to expand their frames of reference, to develop self-reflexivity, and to develop ethical relationships with others, uh, especially across uh, these hierarchies that have been historically created. And here are four different areas where that can happen. One is internationalization and diversity here, already here in Australia, in our classrooms. Two is alternative frames and futures, which connects with discourses of education in the 21st century. The idea of uh, the, the difference between achievement and growth is very much there that requires a different understanding of knowledge. Um, number three, addressing the effects and causes of inequality. A lot of work needs to be done there in terms of us understanding what creates the crisis, the global crisis that we face today. And number four, building ethical relationships with marginalized communities locally and internationally. And this is the topic of the workshops. We're going to be looking at stories and um, questions and practices in this uh, four dimensions. So if you're interested, uh, my scholarship is available mostly for free on academia.edu. I have already put this presentation there under talks. The only thing is that you have to have an academia.edu um, login to be able to access it. But, uh, and this is the, the academic work. In terms of uh, teacher education work and work with schools and governments, I'm supporting and working with a group of uh, younger researchers, scholars, um, uh, artists and educators trying to translate these things into uh, practices um, that can be relevant and accessible to teachers and adaptable to different contexts. And this is the project that, uh, of the network that they have created. It's called Other Steps. Uh, here we have the email. I, I also put the presentation on their website so that if you don't have a login at academia.edu, uh, you can access what they have to offer. They offer online uh, professional development, resources and program reviews in relation to the things that I've talked about. So I think I'm going to stop here so that we can have time for questions. If you have any questions or comments or engagements, I'm very happy um, to start this conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Vanessa. We've got our microphones there, Gary, have we? Yep, Gary's got one, and Russell's got one over here. So is there any questions for Vanessa from the floor? One here, Russell.
Thank you for the presentation. Joel Backwell, the um, head of the International Education Division in the Victorian Department of Education. Um, I've been in this role for about four months now, and a lot of the discussion of intercultural understanding and intercultural communication often gets bogged down in, in language, second language learning. Um, so from what you've seen in Canada, how, how important is that aspect, but how can we also sort of move away from that to make everything that you're talking about a bit more front and centre to what we do and not get put into that bucket over there that's an add-on once you sort out literacy and numeracy? Yeah, it's very, um, just going to here, because otherwise I can see it. Anyway, I'll speak from here. Um, you're absolutely right. It generally gets associated with uh, language learning, and it's like ticking the box. Uh, what I'm talking about is understanding uh, identities very differently, um, and working with um, the historically um, created labels we have given to each other and the relationship between these labels. And this in can involve language, but also can be done um, in different ways. It's related to our relationship to these labels and the relationship that uh, the students themselves have to these labels and how they are renegotiating it. I think the best thing is to give you an example of that in my, um, in my work <laughs> as a mother uh, of immigrant children. Uh, so this is... Is it okay if I tell the story? Because I'm not sure if we have the time. Okay, sure. So um, my my daughter was five. Uh, well, we, she was there in England from uh, one to five, and so she learned English at school and at home. We start, we spoke Portuguese, and there was no support in England for uh, bilingualism. But it is extremely hard for families. I think people underestimate how hard it is to keep a bilingual um, a bilingual environment. So when she was five. Um, she was fluent in English and in Portuguese and had a very strong Nottingham accent, right? <laughs> so one day she comes back home and she tells me, Mom, can you, not, can you please not pick me up at school anymore? And I said, why? Why is it that? And she said, because I would like, she's fairer than me, so she said, I would like to hang out with the, the pretty girls. And I said, what are you saying? She said, uh, brown girls are not as beautiful. And I said, wait a minute, I'm brown. <laughs> are, you, are you telling me I'm not beautiful? And she said, oh, you're my mom, you don't count. <laughs> so I said, okay, <laughs> there's something going on here, and I need to go and, and, and talk to the, to the teacher, right? And it was a school that received awards for multicultural teaching and learning. So I arrived in the classroom, and I told the teacher, said, this is what my daughter has told me I'm, I'm really concerned about uh, racism being <laughs> Uh, already uh, developed here. And the teacher got really anxious and she said, no, that's not the case, already without even thinking about it. And she opened the door of the classroom uh, where, and we looked into the playground and she said, all the children are playing here. And it was true, the ch children were playing, everyone in their own groups, right? So where the Indian kids were playing amongst themselves, um, the kids from Kenya were playing amongst themselves, and Giovanna, the only Brazilian, was trying to figure out where she belonged. And in her mind, she had figured out the hierarchies already. So I told the teacher, well, we, we need to do something. She said, no, there's no problem here. So one of the things that I, I, I figured out, not there, but uh, also in, in my other work, is that teachers are very, it, it's like a, a, a can of worms. We don't wanna, we don't wanna open, because maybe uh, we don't feel prepared to deal with uh, the problem, especially when we have received an award. So that goes back to the achievement, right, thing. So I decided to take it to the board, because I was part of the board, uh, of the school, the, the, the school board, and I, I told again the principal what had happened, and the principal said, no worries, we're gonna sort it out. So what they decided to do was to organize a catwalk, a fashion uh, beauty context, which absolutely didn't work, and they had chosen, <laughs> They had chosen three kinds of girls to win it, to, show, to try to um, um, challenge the notions of beauty, but it was uh, very inappropriate because number one, it reinforced the idea of body image, which was already an issue for girls, and uh, the girls worked out that what they were trying to do was not gonna have any impact on what was happening in the playground anyway. So I left uh, the school to go to New Zealand 
um, also because my son was going through some of the, the issues in his secondary school at the time. So when we arrived in New Zealand, Giovanna was six, and I went to the school uh, with her passport to register her, and the, t the secretary looked at the passport and said, oh, she's Brazilian, she needs to go to a withdrawal class. And I said, no, she <laughs> has been living in England, we speak Portuguese at home, but uh, she speaks not in English. <laughs> and uh, the secretary said, no, our school policy is that she goes to a withdrawal class. I had already been fighting that other fight, I decided, you know what, go, let her go to the withdrawal class and then the teacher will figure it out that she speaks English. So the first day, <laughs> she goes to the withdrawal class and comes back home and asks me, uh, can I talk to you? Um, like she sits, and I said, sure. <laughs> she said, there are two things I need to tell you. One is really good, the other, I'm not sure. I said, sure. Number one, I said, tell me the good one first. She said, we didn't have any classes. I was taken out of the class and I had a free day. And I said, at six, you already know that it is a good thing, right? <laughs> that's the first thing I said, okay, so that's the withdrawal class. And then I said, what's the second thing? And she said, oh, the, the, well, the teacher, it was all Korean kids and, and Chinese kids and then me, but the, kid, the teacher put us all on the floor, uh, sitting on the floor, and she told us that now that we are in New Zealand, we are all Kiwis. And I, I, I knew she knew what a Kiwi was. I said, you know that it's New Zealand or not, right? And I said, so what's the problem? And I'm quoting her literally here. She said, are they trying to arrest my mind? Right? At six. We had seen a film of, uh, that probably had that sentence, <laughs> but she repeated it back to me. And I said, well, I don't know. Maybe, and I didn't know what to do. I said, maybe being a Kiwi is a good, maybe it can mean different things. Maybe you can redefine what it means. And she said, no, I, I'm not sure. Like, in, I think the, the sense that she had was that this was being imposed. In England, they, nobody would ever say, now that you're in England, you're English. That's, forget it, right? It was not going to be said to her. But now she was saying, does the opposite then is a good thing? And then she went off to play. Two months later, there was, uh, in the same school, a, an international day. And then the letter came home that she needed to be Brazilian. So first she was a Kiwi, and now she was being forced to be a Brazilian. And she said, um, I don't want to be a Brazilian because you have to carry um, a flag in the school, right? And I don't want the spotlight to be on me on the second month of classes. So I said, okay, so what exactly do you want? She said, I, I think this International Day is all about dressing up, isn't it? I said, I don't know. Is this what you think it is? And she said, yes. So I said, what would you like to, to, to wear on the day? And she said, I want to wear my shiny shoes that I'm not allowed to wear, that I was allowed to wear in England. I said, sure, okay, so you wear your shiny shoes and what else? And she said, oh, then I'll have to choose on the day. And I said, okay, so you're gonna wear your shiny, shiny shoes and something, and what hue are you gonna be, right, of the nationalities? She said, it doesn't matter, it could be the Kiwis, the, the, the Chinese, not the Brazilian because I'm the only one, but what really matters is that I'm feeling good about uh, joining this. I said, okay, go to your, to your teacher, talk to it was a him at the time, talk to him and see what he says. She came back home, the teacher told me that what really counts is your identity is the place where you were born. Uh, and then she said, and then he suggested I should wear either a football shirt or a samba dancer thing. And I said, what is a samba dancer? So in our part of the country, she, would, she wasn't exposed to that. So I showed it to her, she said, no way, I'm not gonna wear this. And I just started crying and I said, okay, we will need to negotiate this. Um, and the negotiation was um, yellow and green clothes in the shiny shoe, plus uh, her carrying this flag, um, very upset about the flag, but not upset about other things that were happening on the day, which was an interesting experience for her. I didn't want her to, um, at the time, uh, to talk to the teachers. Later on, I went to talk to the teachers to see if we could have any other way of consulting both of the families and the students on how this could be better addressed. And there are intergenerational conflicts in that, of families trying to keep traditions and students resisting traditions. There's all the relationships at school being played out, of things, but it, it was a conversation they hadn't had 
at the time, and it was important that they had. So I think the stories show that it is um, it, it goes much far further than language. Uh, sitting at the edge of how students are renegotiating their identities and um, power relations in their environment are things that cannot be brushed aside, that need to be part of the conversation. And part of our own recognizing where we come from in terms of our relationship to identity and to knowledge and what we expect the students to be or to do in relation to ourselves as well, this idea of coherence, uh, is something that we're only starting to talk about in education. So this, does this answer the question? <laughs> What a wonderful story, and uh, I'm sure many of us have been put in the same position with uh, our diverse communities. Uh, can I thank you, Vanessa, very, very much for her presentation. It was very, very enlightening. Thank you again.